you could move this heart to be set apart i don't need to recognize the man in the mirror and i don't want to trade your plan for something familiar i can't wait today i can't stay the same i wanna be different i wanna be changed till all of me is gone and all that remains is a fire so bright the whole world can see that there's something different so come and be different in me and i don't want to spend my life stuck in a pattern and i don't want to gain this world but lose what matters and so i'm giving up everything because i want to be Never be more lost than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. Does it take a trophy to make you cry? I'll never be more lost than I am right now. Ooh. Going through a storm. But I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the winds that call me out. You would cross an ocean, so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. Let's sing it all, y'all. You are a child. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all on this brisk Florida day. We don't always have these, uh, these colder days, so enjoy it while it lasts. It's probably going to go away 
quickly, which is good for those of you that don't like cold. The warm will be back soon, I'm sure. Uh, so good to see you all this morning. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a first-time guest, we're so glad that you're here, excited to worship the Lord uh, together with you this morning. Uh, we would just ask, uh, in the seat backs in front of you, you'll find uh, what we call our Connect cards. Uh, at your convenience, uh, take a moment and fill that card out. It'll allow us to get you connected with all that we have going on here uh, at the church. Um, which, speaking of that, uh, you should have all received bulletins when you walked in, and so uh, go ahead and bring those out. Uh, and while you're doing that, I just want to remind you, first-time guests, uh, when you leave today, uh, Pastor Ron would love the opportunity to meet you, and so you'll take those, um, those Connect cards, and you'll head out these uh, double white doors here and make an immediate left into what we call our garden room, and you'll see a welcome desk there, uh, and we would love to just meet you and ha uh, put a gift in your hands. Just thank you for being here. Uh, at FBC Pompano with us uh, this morning. Uh, so on your bulletins, you'll see um, some things that are happening now and upcoming things. Uh, so when you have an opportunity, look through everything to save the dates as well. Uh, but I do want to bring your attention to just a few things. Uh, you'll see there at the top, you'll see um, we have a men's Bible study that is starting. The women's is already ongoing right now, and you can still join in on that. Uh, but the men's Bible study uh, is happening uh, February 1st. It's starting, and super excited uh, for that. We have two just amazing men who are leading that, uh, Miguel Lopez and, and Chris Beck. And so we are so excited for that. So men, you won't want to miss it. Get registered for that. You can visit our website at fbcpompano.org for that. You've seen over the last couple months as well, you've seen um, our uh, mission trip that we're going on to the Dominican Republic. And so if you are interested in knowing more about that, please reach out to Pastor Don. You'll see his contact info there. Uh, and then last week, um, I made an announcement about um, the Sonia Larson um, committee that I just wanted to correct. Um, I, the, the, the needs for that committee, it's not for the selection of the scholarships, it's for uh, helping, and what do you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's for just helping with um, getting the tournament going and the planning of the tournament and all of that stuff. So you, if you are good at that and, and great at event planning and stuff like that and you're interested, please reach out to us to be part of that committee. Uh, and then last but not least is our cornhole tournament that is coming up on February 4th. Uh, that is uh, a Sunday, and this is the first time we're doing this as a student ministry. We generally do a fundraiser at the beginning of the year, and what this fundraiser supports is our Disciple Now weekend in March. Uh, that is an overnight event. Uh, some of you have been part of that before where uh, different church members open up their homes, and we have a speaker that comes in uh, for that. And the week is really just a targeted week for us to focus on our relationship with Jesus and where we're at, um, kind of just as a great springboard into the rest of the semester, growing in our relationship with Jesus and in our relationships with one another. So it's a great event. The fundraiser helps lower the cost of that event. There is costs associated with that. And so uh, that's what that goes toward. Uh, the Cornhole Tournament, it's really just a, a, an event. We're trying to do some fundraisers that get the whole church involved. Cornhole is a game that no matter where you're at in sports or at athletic ability that you think you're at, anybody can play cornhole. Uh, sixth grade and up all the way through adulthood are welcome to play. Uh, the cost is $15 a person. We're looking for teams of two. Um, if you are somebody that maybe you don't have a team of two, but you'd like to sign up, you can still sign up as well, and then we'll pair you up. Um, but that is, it's an event the whole family's invited to. Even if you're not participating, you can come on out and get concessions, and that goes toward it as well. And then it's just going to be a whole good uh, kind of just church family event on that Sunday immediately following service. So if you're interested, we need to know because we got to get stuff planned and brackets planned uh, for that. And so there's a sign-up table out there. Uh, we would love to get as many people participating in that as possible to lower the cost of Disciple Now weekend. Uh, that's all I have in the way of announcements. I'm going to turn it over to Noah as we worship. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Let's stand this morning. We're going to open up um, our Bible for our call to worship. Um, this morning, our call to worship is from Psalms 146, verse 10. It says, The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. I feel like it just it gives like this nice eternal aspect to praise and um, just the Lord and how he gets to receive praise from us because it says for all generations. You know, there's been many generations in the past and there's possibly many more to come. Nobody knows, but all those generations, they have the same goal of praising the Lord, the same purpose, the same design of praising and worshiping the Lord. And so this morning, like, that's what we're here to do, right? Like, we're not here to just see our friends or to just hang out with people or even to just... Um, just be like going to church on a Sunday, like it's a checklist item, you know, but we're here because 
We're praising the Lord. Like, there's glory to be had here this morning. And so this morning, as we open up the word and as we worship, let's just keep our minds focused on Jesus, focused on the Lord, and just, because he's so worthy of it. Right, church? Like, he is worthy of our praise. So let's go ahead and worship him this morning.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the Sing praise the Father. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory. Majesty. Praise forever to the King. Reveal the kingdom to reveal the kingdom's coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead arose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel Truth of all shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, and in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who 
Would you sing with me? Praise the Father. Praise the Father. Praise the We just thank you. Lord, we praise you this morning. Hear our voices, Lord. You are worthy of our praise, God. Help us to worship you. Enter in with us this morning, God. Bring your presence here. Go before us, Lord. If there's anything in between you and us, Lord, just remove it. We can't do that on our own, Lord. You make a way for that. You break our chains, Father. Oh, you are so good. You are so worthy, Father. Let's continue to worship him this morning.
don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And that is who you are. Lord, that is who you are, Father. You make a way for us. You keep your promises, Lord. Lord, you're here, God. You're working on our hearts. You're touching our lives, God. Lord, I pray we let you in. Do your work here, God. We pray as we just open up your word this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us. Teach us, Lord. Reach us. We need you, God. We pray that you just speak through Ron this morning. You give him power, Lord. Give him your power. Give him your words, Father. We want to hear from you, Lord. We're ready. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Show your love to these guys. They did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. All right. We are, uh, we're in a new series, uh, Truths We Treasure Together. We're going to start that today. And uh, we have a saying around, those who are guests here today, you may not realize that, but we have a saying that we use around here, and that is we like to say we're family. Uh, let's, don't we love to say that? Okay. In fact, why don't we say it together? You ready? Let's do it right now. Okay. We're, we're family. That's right. Uh, in fact, you know, Olive Garden, I got the idea from Olive Garden, because Olive Garden says when you're here, you're family, but we're actually one better, because not only are you family when you're here, but when you're away from here, you're still family, right? And so, let's say it together one more time, we're family. And so, uh, and that's true, we are family, but it actually goes deeper. Uh, we have a family which embraces certain truths together as a community. Uh, we don't just belong together, we believe together. And we have certain truths that bring us together. The very reason why we're here, the very reason why we call ourselves family is because we've come together under certain truths. And, and we're going to be talking about those truths over the next few weeks. I'm really, really excited about this series. Can you tell I'm excited about this series? Yeah, I'm, telling, I'm excited about this series. And, and the first of these today that we're going to tackle is the Bible is the Word of God. 
there's no way that I can tell you how much I love God's Word, and we're going to be talking about that today. So go ahead and get your Bible handy. Uh, your, uh, your, your, some of you have a book in your hand, some of you have an electronic device, wherever you carry it, just make sure you have it handy, and, uh, and we're going to look at that together. Have your notes ready as well, and, and I hope you'll take notes as you go through this as we talk about the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. But so often I like to kind of get you ready for a sermon and prepare it for you, prepare it for you. and uh, there is a Mexican place that Rhonda and I for, for several years have gone to, not too very far away from our church. And I know that not only do, have we enjoyed going there over, we've been there dozens of times, but, but you enjoy it because I see you there. Dan, I've been with you there, and, and, and Buddy and others, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of folks here that I've seen you at this particular Mexican place, and when I go to that place, I, I order one of two things, and, and one of those is I love the crunchy tacos, you know, I just... I love good old crunchy tacos, beef tacos, and, you know, the rice and beans, and I'm getting hungry just talking about it, y'all. Why don't we just leave and go to go eat, okay? I, I mean, I just love that stuff there, and, and I've, I've ordered, I don't know how many times I've ordered it, and I ordered it this particular time. The last time I went, I ordered this, and, and uh, they brought it, and I enjoyed it. It was great, and then when they brought me the bill, I looked at the bill, and they had added something to the bill, and that is, for the beef, I had to pay extra. Like, what? Like, who... Who makes you pay extra for the beef? And so I called the server over there, and, and I began to talk to her about it. I said, I've noticed you've added for this. She said, yeah, if you want beef on your taco, you have to pay extra. I'm like, what? I mean, that's like ordering a BLT and having to pay extra for the bacon, you know? Or a PBJ and having to pay extra for the peanut butter. Like, who does that if you don't have beef in it or, 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 or fish or, or chicken or something in there? What you have is a salad in a tortilla. And I would have said more, but once again, there's a lot of church members away, around, so I, I could not do that. So I simply paid the bill. That was the last time we went there, okay? <laughs> yeah, he's like, you're that kind of guy. No, actually, the place closed down not too long after that, yeah. But yeah, I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder why that happened. Which is to say, don't mess with this pastor, because you never know what will happen. <laughs> Just teasing. Yeah, nothing in the world to do with it. Just teasing what it. So what I'm trying to say to you is that what is a taco without meat in it? Well, the Bible is the meat on our menu of ministry. Let me say it again. The the, the Bible, the Word of God, is our meat on the menu of ministry. We don't gather around here without studying God's Word. It is central to all that we do here is to study the Bible. And that is what we do, and that is who we are. We have gathered together in this place, not just as a family, but as a people who realize that this is God's holy word. We believe in this place that the Bible is the word of God. It is central to all we do. Can I get an amen? Amen, Amen, that's right. We celebrate that. And we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to use the passage that 2 Timothy chapter... My time is not up, by the way. I, I just... Yeah, good, good luck with that. I try, yeah. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and, and uh, 17. <laughs> we'll put that on the screen for you. I love this passage of Scripture where uh, the Word of God says this. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is a reading from God's holy word and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Just take a moment. Notice it says all scripture. We don't believe it's just part of scripture. We believe all of scripture is inspired by God. It is, and not just inspired. The King James Version says inspired, and that's a great translation, but translators later said we need to go a little bit deeper because the word that is found in the Greek means God breathed. That means that that every thought of it, every, every word of it, every syllable of it comes from God. It is a product of God himself. It is God-breathed, and thus, it is useful for teaching. How do we know how we should walk? How do we know how we should build our families and our lives? It is according to the word of God. It teaches us the way that we should go. Not only is it useful for teaching, but for rebuking. Because sometimes we make a misstep, Right? Am I the only one here who's made a misstep? No, we've all done that, right? We're all sinners and we make missteps. And so what happens, the word of God comes along when I take a misstep in the wrong direction and it rebukes me, it tells me, you got to get your act together. You got to get back on the right path. 
And so not only does it rebuke us, but it corrects us. It gets us right on the right path in terms of how we should then live. But not only does it do that, but it trains us. It not only tells us and teaches us, it trains us in the way that we should walk. And the result of that is so that every man of God and woman of God may not only be equipped, but be thoroughly equipped. It is perfect. Nothing is lacking in God's word to equip you to be a man and woman of God. He will, it, will help you to, for every, it will help you in terms of every good work. And that is the promise of Scripture. And all God's people said what? Amen. Amen. And we believe that around here. So as we begin to kind of unpack this and to apply this, to our lives, you'll notice here, the first thing you'll notice in your notes, and feel, please fill this in, is that we've learned this, and that is that you can trust in the Bible, for it is always true. You can trust in the Bible, for it is always true. In Psalm 119, verse 160, it says, all your words are true. I can tell you this, I've been studying the Word of God daily, as you know, since I was 14 years old. I have never learned anything from God's word and said that doesn't work or that was wrong I've done that with others some of you have given me advice and and I've taken I've said well that was bad advice you know you know or we've read things and believed it and said no that's not true but when it comes to God's word I don't regret one decision I've made in obedience to God's word how about you we love God's word don't we And we've come to learn over the years that, hey, you can trust in the Bible for it is always true. We have a confessional statement, and it really doesn't come from us. It comes from other Baptists. We got together uh, in in terms of what we call the SBC. That is our our convention of churches that that, that do missions around the world. And we said we got to make sure that we define and then redefine exactly what we stand for. In fact, Dr. Al Mohler, who grew up in this church, was on that committee. And they came together, and they said, this is how we want to state it. And that is, and we'll put that on the screen for you, in what's called our Baptist Faith and Message. It says, regarding Scripture, it is truth without any mixture of Scripture. It is truth without any mixture of Scripture. And the theologians who are part of this, they explain what they meant by that, and they said this. They said that, in terms of the Bible, that it is complete, nothing needs to be added. It is correct, nothing needs to be altered. And that is exactly right. Amen? Amen? That's exactly right. If you don't believe it, just ask the Apostle Paul. That's what Paul said. The Apostle Paul, the great missionary to the Gentiles, he said all Scripture is God-breathed. He believed it. Well, what about Peter? Peter, who walked along with Jesus from the very beginning. Peter said this in, in, 2, P- Peter, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's go ahead and advance the screen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. He said, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is the product of God's Holy Spirit. If you don't believe Peter, then ask the Apostle John. The Apostle John wrote the last book. He got the last word in Scripture, and this is what he said in the last word, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. He says, if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy or adds to it, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life. Pretty serious words, right, in terms of how we should view God's word. If you don't believe any of them, then you ought to believe Jesus, because Jesus said to the Heavenly Father and some of his last words before his betrayal and, uh, and before the crucifixion, he said in the high priestly prayer, he said to the Father, he said, your word is truth. That's what Jesus said. Can I get an amen on that? Jesus knew what he was talking about when he talked to the Heavenly Father who gave us the word of God. Now, theologians have said it in different ways. I'll just kind of share with you some of the things I've read over the years, and that is that God's word is, in terms of understanding it practically, it is pure as sunlight it's not mixed with darkness. It's not diluted with falsehood. The theologians who produced our confessional statement said this. They said, related to God's word, it's not filled with human traditions which are fallacious and fallible. God has given us a pure record of truth, inerrant and infallible. Now I have to tell you this. Our church has been here 108 years, right? How about that? 108 years. Not everybody, by the way, guess, not everybody who applauded has been here for the whole 108 years. I'm not suggesting that, but we've been here uh, for, for that length of time. And this has always been our long-standing belief as a community of faith. We just, around here, we believe the Bible is the word of God. Amen? Now, we, we believe what the psalmist said when he said in Psalm 119, 151, You are near, O Lord, and all your commands are true. 
That is true. The Bible is true in all aspects. The Bible is true in all respects. When the Bible speaks historic fact, as in the case of the resurrection, it never needs correcting. When the Bible speaks scientific fact, as in the creation, it never needs changing. When the Bible speaks spiritual truth, as it declares Jesus is Savior and Lord, it never needs challenging. Amen? Which is to say, it always tells the truth. It is the truth and nothing but the truth. Jesus was right when he said to the Heavenly Father, your word is truth. That's what we believe concerning Scripture. And yet, in our culture, there are many who openly attack Scripture. There are many who openly attack Scripture, or there are others who undermine it. I have been on the Internet this week. I don't know why. And I have read many, many articles. I've been reading where people who attack Scripture. Uh, there's no lack of that out there. There's everybody, there's always somebody who thinks they know more than Scripture. So don't be surprised by that. We're not trying to get a popularity contest going here. We're not trying to get more people in favor of Scripture than are against Scripture. So, because we may not win that battle until Jesus comes back. But we just need to acknowledge there are many who openly attack Scripture. And, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I'll, I'll deal with that. Darkness is always going to represent darkness, right? But I tell you what I don't like. I don't like those who subtly undermine it. Because there are those who are religious figures in our day. And there are denominations in our day. There are some people that call themselves anything from a priest to a prophet to a pope who, who undermine Scripture by what they say and what they do. And I've got a problem with that. I've got a problem with those who identify themselves as spiritual shepherds and yet they are apologetic about Scripture or try to excuse Scripture or only preach certain passages because they're embarrassed about the other passages. In this place, with this preacher, we preach the whole Word of God. We believe it is God's truth. Amen? And that's, just, that's not just my belief. That is our shared belief. I really, really, in my in this generation, I have a problem with all these religious fig figures that are embarrassed about Scripture because this is God's Word. This is God's Word. Why would we be embarrassed to God for His Word? And yet there are those who, will, who indeed undermine it or certainly openly attack it. Yeah, but there's nothing new here. There's, there's nothing new here. You know, they used to say, for instance... They used to take Isaiah 53. Do you know what Isaiah 53 is? Isaiah 53 was written by Isaiah 800 years before Christ lived. And it deals with, in a it's a detailed account of the death of Christ that took place at Calvary. It is almost as though Isaiah was sitting there looking at Calvary, looking at Christ on the cross, and writing down a detailed account of what is taking place. The only thing is that it happened 800 years before Christ. And yet they used to say that it was actually written after the time of Christ and then inserted into the ancient text. They used to say Christians add it later to reinforce their belief in Christ's atoning work. Now they used to say that because the oldest Old Testament manuscript that we had for many years was 900 A.D. Let that sink in, 900 A.D. That's 900 years after the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. 900 years. But about a decade before I was born, there was a little shepherd boy who threw a rock into a cave, and he heard a crash. And they're in Israel, and that is how they discovered in 1947, they discovered 40,000 manuscripts that are 1,000 years before anything that had ever been found before. You got that? So suddenly, about a decade before I was born, they suddenly find now, they go back 1,000 years to all these manuscripts. And so newspapers and accounts in, in that day used to say that we're going to discover that none of that was actually in the original Isaiah, but that was added years later. It was placed in there is what they said. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, is what we call it, they found an entire manuscript of Isaiah dated 100 years before Christ. You got that? 100 years before Jesus lived. And after a thousand years of copying and recopying, there are only 17 letters that are in question. And these are stylistic changes and spelling differences. 
None of the original meaning of Isaiah has changed as a result of this discovery, which is to say God's word is true. Amen? Amen. God's word is true. But they used to say that Isaiah 53 was added later. Now we know different. They used to say that Moses could not have written the Pentateuch because language was not developed and written as such back in, in 1400 B.C. But in 1974, when I am in college, they unearthed what's called the, the Ebla tablets in North Syria. And these were 17,000 clay tablets, and they proved that there was writing much earlier actual than the time of Moses, and indeed it was advanced. And so everything they used to say, we now know is wrong what they said. When you read the Bible, you run into groups like the Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Hittites. I've never done a series on the Hittites, probably won't. But there are over 50 references to the Hittites in the Bible, in the Old Testament. They used to say that that was made up years later because in secular history, according to archaeology, there is no group called the Hittites until they unearthed 1,200 years of detailed description of the culture of people called the Hittites. Scripture was right, they were wrong. They used to say the specifics of Genesis are not consistent with ancient culture of that day. It was added later because back in that day, that was not the way people lived their lives until they unearthed the Newsy tablets in 1925 with 1,000 clay tablets which date back to the approximate time of Abraham's descendants in Genesis. And all of a sudden, all these things that we wondered about in Genesis, like, well, what does that mean? All of a sudden, it makes a lot of sense now because now we have tablets that tell us about the culture. These aren't religious tablets. These are secular tablets that tell us all about the culture. You say, like, can you give me for instance? Okay, I'll give you for instance. Do you remember when, when Rachel and Jacob were trying to get away from Laban? You remember that? You remember that? You know, they're trying to get away from family. Some of you may have tried that yourself. I don't know. Have you ever tried to get away from family? They're trying to get away from family. And, and so Rachel, she stole the teraphim. You remember the teraphim, the, the, the idol there in the, you know, in the cedar chest, I guess, there in, in Laban's place. And, and so, so he comes after them. He's all upset about it. And so there, uh, there we find Rachel's actually sitting on it, pretending like she doesn't know what he's talking about. And she's hiding it. And we said, well, why would a God worshiper steal an idol like that? What was that all about? And then when we read the Newsy tablets, what we discovered is that, is that that was the legal claim on the family property and possessions. Without Jacob even knowing, she was protecting them from having Laban take all their possessions away. That was like a legal document. The Newsy tablets explain all of that. Once again, we come to realize that Genesis is right on target when it com comes to the culture of that day. Once again, they were wrong. Scripture is right. Amen. Amen. They used to say there was no such place as Jericho until they unearthed the crumbled walls there at the site and discovered they even fell in the way that the Old Testament describes it. They used to say there was no such thing as the Exodus until they found stone tablets which artistically depict the Exodus that comes from that very era in that region of the world. They used to say, believe it or not, you're going to die when I tell you this. They used to say there was actually no King David. That was made up years later. Do you know that when I, after the time that I came as your pastor, they were still saying that. There's over 40 references in the Old Testament to the house of David, but scholars and historians said there is no such guy as David found in Israel until they found his name on tablets. Since I've been your pastor, they have found his name as King David on tablets. Which is to say, what they used to say is just wrong. And it will continue to be wrong. And those who similarly say, they will be wrong and they will fail. Because God's word is true. I'm not afraid of science. I'm not afraid of archaeology. Anything they unearth only confirms what we already know. The Bible is the word of God. Amen. Amen. But I want you to get used to the water because the Bible ever will be under attack because it's always been under attack. Now, some of you know or have heard the name Voltaire, a French deist, skeptic, philosopher, historian. If you lived back in the late 18th, uh, 18th century, you would know him because everybody knew a guy by the name of Voltaire. He built his life. He devoted his life to the eradication of Christianity. And everybody knew that. This was during the same time frame as the Great Awakening 
in America, in England, the greatest revival we've ever experienced from the 1730s to the 1780s, an amazing revival took place uh, during the time frame of the birth of our nation, took place in England as well, under the Wesleys, and just, it's just phenomenal what took place. And what we call the Great Awakening, it hit America, it hit England, it never hit France. One historian said it would have saved them from the French Revolution had it hit France. Great Awakening never took place. That's where Voltaire was located. He devoted his life to attacking the Bible, to attacking Christianity. He died in 1778 and is quoted as saying, and by the way, there are hundreds of similar quotations in his letters and in his documents and his in quotations and magazines, but he's quoted as saying, within 100 years of my death, Christianity will be long gone, swept out of existence and passed into history. That's what he said and it was remembered at his death in 1778. 58 years later, at his residence in Geneva, there was a man by the name of Captain Henry Tronchin. Captain Henry Tronchin had come to know Jesus, which is significant because he was a descendant, a grand descendant of Tronchin, who was the doctor to Voltaire, who was the skeptic who financed all of his publications. But somewhere along the line, the family got converted. So now, Captain Henry Tronchin purchased his house there in Geneva. And according to him, that house was now, and by the way, by that time, he was the president of the Evangelical Society of Geneva. And they used that house for the storage of all the publications of uh, tracts that were sent around the world to evangelize and Bibles, they were stored there in Voltaire's old house. How about that? Not only that, but back in Ferney, France, they had purchased his house, uh, Voltaire's house there, and all of his possessions, and the very printing press that he had used to attack Christianity, to attack the Bible, was now printing Bibles and sending them around the world. How about that? I think we ought to celebrate that. How about that? using his own printing for, and his own paper to print Bibles. <laughs> oh, God has a sense of humor, don't you think? I mean, uh, and certainly, which is to say that, that this is God's word. God is going to win in the end. You don't have to worry about that, right? You don't have to worry about that. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said these words. Uh, we'll put that on the screen for you right now. And that is, there's no need to defend a lion which is being attacked. All we have to do is open the gate and let him out. He will defend himself. He's right. We don't need to worry about defending the Bible or protecting the, the Bible from critics or destruction. All we need to do is live by it and let it loose. Amen? We need to share it with those around us. God will take care of the rest. Can I get an amen on that? You can trust the Bible for it is always true number two write this down god's word is never out of date and ever relevant god's word is never out of date and ever relevant the psalmist said in psalm 119 1 verse 152 and by the way psalm 119 is all about the word of god that you ought to go read psalm 119 this week because it's just talking about the word of god but it says there long ago i learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever which is to say that God's word is timeless. This week, I've been texting one of our, uh, one of our former staff members, Jane Johnson, that our, who was an incredible children's director for many years here. And, and, um, and I was reminded as I was texting her about, you know, several years ago, there was a child that came home on Sunday after church, and, and his grandfather was at the house. And, and so he told his grandfather that he had learned in church that a 90-year-old woman had a baby. And he said, he said where did you hear that? And, and he said, well, at church. They're, you know, First Baptist Pompano at church. And they said the baby was born to Abraham and Sarah. So the grandfather said, oh, yeah, I remember that story. That's in the Old Testament, close to where it says that God gave Moses a tablet, but he got mad and threw it down and broke it. So the kid heard that God gave Moses a tablet. And the kid was amazed and expressed, I just can't believe God gave Moses an iPad and he just threw it down and broke it. 
Yeah. What was Moses thinking? <laughs> we got a big laugh out of that back then. And which is to say, languages change and technology evolves, but the truth remains the same. God's word is timeless. Psalm 119, 152, once again, long ago I learned from your statutes that they, that you established them to last forever. It's been said, I wish I'd said it, but somebody else said it, the word of God is never obsolete, for it is ever absolute. That's a good word, isn't it? The Bible, the word of God is never obsolete, for it is ever absolute. It is timeless because it is truth. In Psalm 119, verse 160, it says, all your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. It is timeless. It is always relevant. Your, if Psalm 119, 89 says, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And I say all that to say that for you personally, wherever you are in your life, whatever need you have, I just want you to know that the Bible is always just the word you need to hear at any given moment in your life. It is ever relevant. If you want to say, man, I've just got this need in my life. Where do you go? You go to God's word because it will scratch where you're itching. Can I get an amen? It will. Number three, write this down. The Bible is a priceless treasure for your life. The Bible is a priceless treasure for your life. It says that in Psalm 119.72. It says, the law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Oh, my goodness. If you were to move into a house and looked out in the yard and and, and your dog uh, dug up a treasure of silver and gold, you'd probably be excited about it, right? You probably wouldn't just leave it there. You'd probably dig it up and do something with it. We have a priceless treasure that God has given to us, and it requires us to do something with it. And yet it makes me sad to think of the number of Christians who do not read the Bible daily. Though the psalmist says the word of God is more precious than silver and gold. I believe the reason why many Christians do not read the Bible daily is because they don't realize just how valuable it is. I am telling you today, not only as a pastor, but as a Christian, as a follower of Christ Jesus, as a devoted uh, st student of God's Word who studied every day since I was 14 years old, that this book is a priceless treasure for your life. Have you discovered in your life, honestly, have you discovered this treasure, or is it still for you a buried treasure? Still for you, a buried treasure. I was, a few weeks ago, I was talking to my brother. My brother's a retired minister and he's in North Carolina. And he had, on the phone, he had a, a friend from high school. Which, by the way, I knew how they were in high school. I thought it was dangerous that they would be together now, decades later, you know. And his name's Jackie Foster. Jackie was crazy, a lot of fun. And, and we were talking and talking to him on the phone. He sounded like a lot of fun. But it triggered a remembrance uh, this week for me as I was thinking about that conversation with Jackie about his, his dad, Jack. Jack was, was a contractor in our church where I grew up, and, and Jack Foster uh, was, first of all, he did really, really well. He was a wealthy man. He was the first guy that I knew back in the 60s who had a color television set. Remember? Everybody wanted to go over to Jack's house, including me, to watch his RCA a color television set back in the 1960s. I told him this morning one of the things that happened back then, believe it or not, uh, people didn't get enough on Sunday morning. We used to come back on Sunday nights. You remember those days when in our church, that was a big thing coming back on Sunday nights and it was filled. And, and Jack and my dad were just really, really big buddies. And, but Jack got that RCA color television set and for some reason he stopped showing up on Sunday nights. And my dad, he says, where's Jack Foster tonight? And he looked around and everybody's looking. He's not here. He said, he's, he said, he's watching that crazy TV. He's got that color TV he's got. He said, I'm going to pray that God will strike it with lightning, you know, and do you know what happened that night? True story. That night, a storm came through, and lightning struck the antenna, and it came down, and it destroyed that RCA color TV. It made everybody afraid of my dad for some time after that, you know. <laughs> Stay on his good side, you know. Jack Foster loved my dad. And dad called him up one day, and he said, we're going up to Mount Nebo, Arkansas. That's up in the Ozarks. We're going to stay in a cabin up there, and and uh, just wanted to borrow your ice chest because we would load it up with sandwich stuff and all that stuff, you know, and put it in the refrigerator. And, and so he said, yeah, come over and get it. So dad got it, put it in the truck. Huge thing. He was a big fisherman. He would take it out fishing in his big boat and he had the ice chest there. When we got up to Mount Nebo, we got up the mountain. For the first time, we opened up the ice chest and Jack had an envelope in there. Dad opened the envelope and it was filled with cash, enough cash 
not only to buy groceries for the week, but to pay for the cabin for the week, to pay for the gas for the week, and even a little extra on top of that. He just wanted to give that to his pastor. And In fact, Dad, when he saw that and he counted it up, he said, forget the groceries, we're going to go to the steakhouse tonight. We went down there. <laughs> First time I ever ate steak was as a child, was, was that night. And so I thought about Jack Foster as I was talking to Jackie in that story. And The thing is, is that all of us today would say this is a really, really good book. All of you own a Bible, I'm sure. But I want to tell you right now, once you open it up, you begin to realize it's a priceless treasure. There is no end of the depth of God's word and the end of the blessing, what it can mean to your life daily. What other, what other book would you read daily and continue to read daily and it continue to bless your life? I've reread books before, but I've never had one that I want to read every day of my life, and it'd be a blessing to me every day of my life. This is a priceless treasure. Can I get another amen? amen. That's, that's right. Uh, number four, write this down. The last point is that God's word is positively life-changing. It is positively life-changing. In Psalm 19, 7, it says the law of the Lord is perfect. I mean, it really is. It's just perfect. And then it says reviving the soul. In other words, when you get into God's word, it revives the soul. There's something about it that revives you, that, that stirs up your heart for God, that stirs up your heart for living the life that, that he wants for, for you to live. Indeed, that's true. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 explains why. It says, for the word of God is living. It is continuing to, in other words, it's living and powerful in your life and, sh and active and, and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing your soul and spirit. Which means that God's word gets down deep into your soul and your heart. It is life-changing. I'm telling you today that God's word is powerful. You say, well, can you break it down for us? What do you mean by that? Well, I would say God's word is compelling. It, it moves our soul like no other book that you'll ever read. It touches our heart like no other read. It is something different about the Bible from any other book. Those of you who have who are attending my Wednesday night, I started a Wednesday night class in which we're, get, we're dealing with all these, these things on a Wednesday night for, for several weeks and and, and we talked about how, how God's word is just different than any other book that's ever been out there. And that, in that way, it is compelling. Not only is it compelling, but it is comforting. It is comforting. It strengthens us when we're weak. It consoles us when we weep. It lifts us when we are down. It encourages us when we're sad. It calms us when we're anxious. And it empowers us when we are afraid. There is no other book like it. it is God's word. It is comforting. It is also convicting. You get into the word of God or you get into a class or a, or, or a sermon like this and all of a sudden you start feeling convicted by the word of God and the spirit of God and indeed it convicts us. But not only is it convicting, but it is converting. It takes us from condemnation to salvation. It takes us from the darkness and into the light, from death into life. It liberates us from the prison of guilt to the freedom of forgiveness. There is no other book like this that will set your soul free. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. It's also conquering. It conquering. Yeah, it walks us from the valley of despondency to the very mountaintop of victory. And I want to tell you this. One day you're going to face your final conflict. As a pastor, I, am, I have been with many people on the last day of their life. And I want to tell you this. God's word, and I say this based on experience as a pastor, God's word will take you through your final conflict and it will take you to your eternal triumph. It'll take you to the very gates of heaven by God's grace. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Let's celebrate that together, all right? I took a lot of notes this week trying to sell you on the greatness and the grandeur of God's word and I've realized that I'm just not that talented I, I, my words are going to fall short it's just not adequate to describe the greatness and the grandeur of God's word but the final word I want to tell you this is that for the word of God listen carefully for the word of God to be life-changing you've got to not only get into it you've got to allow it to get into you right Remember, the Pharisees got into it in the Old Testament. They didn't allow it to get into them. you got to open your heart, your life, your soul, and say, so be it. Your word, that settles it. 
you got to do it. I read about this company in California. Have you ever noticed how the craziest things come from California? I said that this morning and somebody reminded me that they had come from California and I was sorry that I said it. But California was, uh, was marketing this high, now listen to it, <laughs> this is crazy, a high speed glass bottom boat. I love glass bottom boats. I've been, I've been to Silver Springs and look at the gla glass bottom boat there, you know what I'm saying? You get to see everything beneath you and it's just cool. But a high speed glass bottom boat and it's, it's not real glass, it is high impact acrylic according to their advertisement. It's so clear that you can see through it, but think about it. A high-speed glass bottom boat, what that means is that you're going along at 30 or 40 miles per hour. What is that doing to the fish beneath you? Man, you're frightening them. You're scaring them to death. They're scattering. Do you really want to be in a high-speed glass bottom boat going along that? You're not going to see what's normally happening in the depth of the ocean. Can I get an amen on that? Is that right? That's just crazy. It's crazy, however, what many Christians do with the Bible. We're so busy. We have so many agendas, so many things going on. And so often what we do is that we skim along the surface as fast as we can to have that quiet time, to have that Bible study, to go through, to, to go through a worship experience like that and check that box. We race through the experience and never slow down just to see the depth of God's transforming book. I just want to challenge you today. I love you, and I want to challenge you to take time in your morning, perhaps take time in your evening, to just spend some time to ponder. Don't rush through it, but ponder and meditate, reflect on the beauty, the grandeur, the glory of the truth of God's Word. You will thank me later if you will make that a priority in your life. Do like the psalmist said when he said in Psalm 119, Verse 18, he said, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law or in your book. If daily you will do that, you will see it, and it will change your life forever. Amen? Okay, I'll throw this out as we close out, and that is that I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this out to all you guys that love the NFL, okay? I know there's a lot of, you're going to be watching games later on today. Let's just be honest. Raise your hand if you're going to watch a game today. Just raise your hand, okay? The rest of you are probably lying. You, you think it's a trick question or something. So I'm going to throw this out there for you, and that is that there's probably sometime today in one of the games there's going to be a controversial call, don't you think? And what's going to happen is that there's going to be a receiver who, who will say he caught the ball, but his defender, maybe a quarterback, will say, no, no, he didn't catch the ball. The receiver's going to go like that, and the defender's going to go like, he's going to go like that. The coach of the receiver is going to go like that. And the coach on the other side is going to go, no, no, no. And the fans are going to be up there. And they're going to be voicing their opinion. And you're going to be sitting in front of your TV if it's your favorite saying, You're going to be expressing your feeling and what you think about it. And I'm going to tell you something. It don't really matter. It doesn't matter what the players say. It doesn't matter what the coaches say, what the fans say. Because what will happen is that there's going to be an official. And he's going to go up to one of those little booths that they have. And he's going to look at it. And what's going to happen is that the ref or the umpire or the, or the official is going to make the call. It really doesn't matter what you think. Because the official is going to make the call and that's what's going to matter. Amen? Right? We live in a day in which there's a lot of controversy over social and moral issues. The, the issue really is not how I feel or how you feel, but it's what God says. Because God gets to make the call. Your opinion, in the end, is not going to matter. Your opinion is not going to make a difference. How he feels and what he says ultimately will be the call that counts. The Bible tells us how God calls it related to all these issues. And as for me, that settles it. And that is what we believe about the Bible. Amen? So, the first question you ought to say is, what does the Bible say about this issue? It's the first thing I ask in counseling, what does the Bible say? It's the first thing you ought to ask. The Bible is God's word. You agree? In this church, we believe that. And all God's people said.
Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Dear Father, we come before you. And humbly, Lord, we just acknowledge that your word is what counts. Father, we confess to you our belief in, in your word, Lord. Every breath of it. And so, Father, we pray that you will help us to study to show ourselves approved before you. A workman who are we're not embarrassed or ashamed of our study of your word. Father, help us to learn from it, to live by it, to be obedient to it, to share it. And Father, help us to always be loyal to it. We thank you, dear Lord, for your word. Father, if there's someone here today who's struggling over obedience to your word, Lord, may your spirit bring them to obedience. May your spirit touch our hearts and compel us to follow and to be obedient to your word. Father, there's someone here today without Jesus. We pray, dear Lord, that by your Holy Spirit that you'll move in their hearts. That you'll move them, Lord, that they might confess that they are sinners and ask Jesus to be their Savior. So, dear Lord, we pray for that movement of your Spirit as we pledge our allegiance to your word. And Father, this we pray in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord together. We invite you to stand as we will sing together. And it may be that today that you have a, a need of a counselor, a need of someone to talk to. We invite you to come forward. We have pastors and counselors that are available. If you need to talk to someone, we would love to do that. If you need to pray here at the altar, let's just let God have his way in these last few moments as we close this service out. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa, 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 there in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness lay, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stayed, lost his grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ oh 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 in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll find 
He returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Lord is good, isn't he? You get to stand on his power. If it's your first time here, um, Pastor Ron, he's making his way out to the garden right now. So as you go out, it'll be to your left. Right now, it's to your right. But if you turn around as you go out, it will be to your left. And he wants to greet you and meet you and give you a gift and just welcome you here at FBC Pompano. Also on your way out, the ushers, they'll have their plates for any weekly offerings. Your guys' generosity is what fuels the ministries here at FBC Pompano. And we are very, very grateful for your giving. So we just thank you guys so much for that. As you guys go out, let me give you this benediction. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We'll see you guys next week.